I'm really pleased to be talking in this Open Access Week um, and giving this inaugural lecture to your Open Research Group because, as you will discover in the course of this talk, open research is certainly something I am extremely interested in and think uh, is actually increasingly important in a world where we are being assailed by a number of nefarious forces. Um, and the point I'm going to make is that uh, fraud is suddenly becoming a serious issue, whereas in the past we've tended to think of it as a rather minor part of the scientific landscape. So, um, I'll say a bit for. So, open research practices covers a great many different types of activity. Um, open access, making publications freely available so anybody can read them. Um, that's, I think, become a default in many places. Um, whereas when I started out in the field, it was very rare, and then it sort of came in and became uh, much appreciated. Um, open sharing of data is now beginning to become, again, more uh, widely used and sometimes mandated by funders. Um, less common is open sharing of the actual scripts you use to analyse data, but in my view that is extremely valuable too. Um, and then there's also open peer review, which I'll have quite a lot to say about, and this can take a number of forms. Uh, originally people tended to mean just making the names of reviewers available to authors. Um, but these days it's more um, commonly done that the peer reviews themselves are published with a paper, sometimes with and sometimes without the name of the person who wrote the review. And I'm going to argue that is particularly useful, as is also what is known as post-publication peer review, where you can have a website where you can link to the paper and make comments um, on it. And I'm going to be talking particularly about the pub peer uh, website, which I think has been very valuable. Mostly, though, when people are discussing benefits and disadvantages and unforeseen consequences of open research, they're really just focused on the normal practice of research. Um, whereas I am going to be focused here on the abnormal practice of research, where I think open research practices come into their own in helping us tackle what is essentially fraud. So what about fraud? I mean, most people don't think it's a big problem. People say, well, it's not terribly common. Science is self-correcting and fraud is very rare. But um, actually, unfortunately, we're increasingly finding that is not the case. Um, and we know less about cases of individual fraudsters um, which and how common that is. I mean, a good fraudster doesn't get caught, of course. But what is really concerning is the industrial scale frauds that are now getting to be commonplace. Um, so I said here, you know, we need to recalibrate how we think about this. Um, there have been papers in Nature and, uh, and in Retraction Watch pointing out that there are fake paper factories that churn out sham science. Um, the so-called paper mill problem. So these are, a paper mill is a fake organisation that will uh, encourage the publication of a lot of uh, fake, pe fake and fraudulent work. Um, there was a, an announcement back in September that the physics publisher, the Institute of Physics, was going to retract nearly 500 likely paper mill papers. And they have done that, the Institute of Physics, uh, to their credit. Um, there was also an announcement that Hindawi, which is a branch of Wiley, were going to retract over 500 papers linked to peer review rings. Um, they haven't, as far as I know, done that yet. Uh, I keep going on at them about on Twitter as to why haven't they, and finding more and more of these weird papers that are in their journals. Um, and this is clearly a big problem because in July this year there was a hearing at the U.S. House Committee on Science, Space and Technology, which uh, was on paper mills and research misconduct. So it's clearly worrying people that there's a, a huge volume of fraudulent research out there. So how does this work? There's, there's a number of models. This one was talked about just this week, I think, or last week, very recently, 25th of October. Um, 
Nick Wise was featured, and Nick is a newcomer on the scene, but who's been very active in looking at paper mill work and managing to dig around and find evidence of um, work, authorship and citations for sale. And in this article, um, he, in, which, uh, in Retraction Watch, he says, you know, he was just shocked. He found there's an entire economy ecosystem of Facebook groups, WhatsApp groups, Telegram channels, selling authorship for papers, selling citations, selling book chapters, selling authorship of patents. There's also uh, mention of this in a talk that you can find online by Bernhard Sabel, who found uh, some Chinese websites where they, you know, it was like a menu, it was like going to Amazon to buy a book or something, you know, they had, you could pay more or less depending on the calibre of the journal and the position of authorship and exactly what you were buying, whether you were buying the already written product or whether your own paper might be massaged into getting into a journal. And there's more about this as well on this For Better Science uh, blog, which uh, is talking about the same issue of papers for sale. <clears throat> so this is this is a real phenomenon. And you think, well, surely this is not going to affect good journals because we have peer review and doesn't it protect us against these fake papers? Um, but there are a number of ways around this. And an article can get published because either it's a really convincing fake, and I'll come on to that and explain how that can be the case. Or, it's not at all convincing, but fake reviewers are used who will accept it for money. Um, or indeed, the editor may also be complicit and again, be getting money in order to wave through fake papers. <clears throat> um, they may also ha allow authors to be added to a genuine paper after it's been accepted for consideration. All of these things have been shown to happen. Let me start with the convincing fakes that come from a template. <clears throat> and the example comes from Cancer Genetics. Uh, Jennifer Byrne uh, has done sterling work on this topic. Uh, she was a cancer geneticist who sort of gave up doing cancer genetics so she could focus on um, tracking down the fakes because they were completely distorting the sort of research she was trying to do. And there are some excellent talks by her online, and I've put a reference at the bottom as well to her extremely succinct and useful um, evidence that she gave to this Science House committee on this topic. But it seems that what you do if you want to make a convincing fake in the field of cancer genetics, you benefit from the fact that there's a huge amount of genes, and there's a huge amount of different phenotypes, different types of cancers and so on, and so if you find a paper that's been published on this topic and it's in a good journal, you can basically create a template based on that paper. And you just need to change the names of the genetic sequences and the phenotypes. You don't need to make a huge number of changes. You can leave the figures there. Um, and then you've got a paper that you can sell to authors who need a publication to progress in their career. And Jennifer Byrne noticed this was happening because she was interested in a rather rare genetic sequence and there wasn't much research in it. And then suddenly there were these papers coming out that were all purporting to be about it, but they had the wrong nucleotide sequences and she could see that something wasn't quite right. And she picked up on this sort of template. Um, and together with Cyril Labbe, um, he developed a, a way to search for these uh, sequences. And they were able to do an automated search for these papers with colleagues ended up screening 12,000 human gene papers automatically and found 700 of them had these wrong sequences suggestive of a paper mill. And if you scale this up to knowing how many uh, gene sequence papers there are in the literature, it is, it is thousands and thousands. This suggests that we have got huge numbers that are wrong. And the thing about these uh, paper mill products is they look plausible, they get into decent journals, they then get picked up and put into meta-analysis and biomedical databases. And an awful lot of genetics research these days is using automated harvesting of data from biomedical databases um, to do things like drug design. So you, this is really high stakes and quite serious. The, then there are the unconvincing fakes, 
which are very easy to detect. Um, and, for example, I found a lot of these, and I call this the gobbledygook sandwich. Um, there's a lot of them that are appearing in journals that are focused on big data and artificial intelligence. Um, and what you start with is a mediocre or, frankly, poor piece of work. Quite often these look like student projects. Um, and they start with an introduction, which looks like the student project. And then suddenly there's a section in the middle which is incredibly technical and mathematical, full of formulae and very sciencey language. And they basically are saying, well, we did this with our, on the topic that we're, we started with in the introduction. And then it goes back at the end in the conclusions um, and basically says, you know, well, we, we used that method and it was all wonderful. It, you know, it's, it's often pretty incoherent what the link actually is. But of course, if you don't really know enough about the sciencey stuff in the middle, you're a bit uncertain as to whether they really did do something sensible with it. Um, one way that you can readily pick these papers up as well is that they tend to sprinkle in citations to completely irrelevant work. So you might have a paper that is on uh, teaching children English, uh, and then there's a, you know, a citation to a work on kidney disease. Um, it, it's it's these are clearly being put in to boost the citation count of those references. And these typically appear in so-called special issues in journals, where the journal has handed over the editorial role to somebody um, who's clearly complicit with the whole thing and is no doubt getting paid for placing these papers in the special issue. And nobody seems to be having any oversight of any of this. So the most crazy things are getting into the literature. If you look at, um, for example, the journal I focused on most recently, Journal of Environmental and Public Health, um, if you look at recent issues of that, and particularly the special issues, of which vastly outnumber the regular papers in the journal, um, you know, you can tell within reading just the abstract that they're crazy stuff, uh, it's, and they often have nothing to do with public health. They're on topics way away, and then they'll have this weird bit in the middle with all the formulae, uh, sometimes, not necessarily, but they are really, uh, you know, strikingly not sensible papers, and yet there they are in the literature. Um, and if you want to see examples of that, just go to the website PubPeer and do the, put in the search term gobbledygook sandwich, because I'm trying to remember to put that in so that it's easy to find them if you do a search, and you'll see a number of stellar examples of this kind of thing. Um, there's also papers that don't seem to start with anything much at all. They're just artificially generated. Um, Cyril Labbe, again, back in 2012, uh, found fake papers that were generated by a software called SciGen, which was actually created as a bit of a joke by three PhD students who wanted to see whether, um, if they submitted meaningless papers to uh, conference proceedings, they'd get accepted. And they obviously did, because there they are in the literature. Um, there's a lot of uh, conferences are published by the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, IEEE, um, and that's a common way to get a publication in that field. And he found a whole load of them, and then he went on and found yet more, not just in IEEE journals, but also in Springer journals. Um, and you can sort of reverse engineer and work out what these papers are. But this is really scary stuff because you try and read these things and, and I find it it sort of does your head in because you 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 know there is no coherence and there is no clear message but they've got the sort of language of science it's it's like being in a parallel universe then there's plagiarism of course um, you can make a fake by just bolting together various plagiarized texts um, but what happens then is that publishers have got aware and they will run things through a plagiarism detector so what happens then is that the paper mill people strike back and invent some software which will change some words for synonyms so that the plagiarism detector can't find them. This has hilariously unfortunate consequences on occasion uh, because it leads to what Guillaume Cabernac uh, and Alexander Magazininov have said are tortured phrases. Um, and they have built software to identify papers that contain these tortured phrases and so there's a sort of battle going on between them and the paper mill people um, to try and sort of unmask these papers rapidly enough that you, you can sort of shut down this kind of activity. But this is the, an example of a paper that uh, is of this kind. Um, 
So you can immediately tell something is odd because instead of talking about Parkinson's disease, they talk about Parkinson's ailment. And then it's got all this fancy artificial intelligence stuff in it, as I've mentioned before. Um, and it's, you know, what on earth is this to do with the application of telecommunication technologies? The whole thing is, is all a bit crazy. But if you go through it, you find that they've got um, tortured phrases. Um, and here are some examples that they can be quite funny. Um, so you get uh, developing countries are turned into creating nations. Um, smart devices are brilliant devices or keen devices. Neuronal death is the passing of neurons. <clears throat> Continuous recording, ceaseless estimations, um, and so on. Uh, I, I found ten, uh, ten crease amused me. I, I looked at it and thought, what is that? And then I realised it's tenfold. Ten crease, a fold and a crease. Um, obviously, though, it doesn't work when you actually do this and a lot of statistical terms become quite hilarious so p values become p esteem and a mean squared error becomes a squared mistake or sometimes a squared blunder um, anyway if you want to have fun you can just put in the phrase tortured phrases on Pumpier and you will see loads and loads of these things um, which and sometimes I mean I like playing word games and so I sometimes just check out articles there and see if I can find some more ones that haven't been spotted already by Kavanagh's detector. Um, and uh, you, it's sort of your, it's like doing a word game because you're trying to reverse engineer and think what was the starting point for this very strange phrase that is in a paper. But does it matter? I mean, you know, I'm saying that a high percentage of the um, dodgy stuff is completely crazy. Nobody would read it and think that they're going to build on it. Um, this isn't true for the stuff that Jennifer Byrne uh, detects, it's either the plausible ones, it's serious because that's going to affect other researchers trying to build on it. But what about these more um, crazy ones that really just don't make sense? I would argue that they do still um, have, pro uh, they still are problematic um, because what is happening, and you can see it happening if you follow paper mills, is that people are building up quite strong-looking reputations on the back of fake pa pa fake publications because they can do it at scale. They can build up a very high H index uh, so from citations because they're controlling not just the publications but the citations. When you get into that position, not only are you perhaps going to be more eligible for a good job, you'll also be eligible for yourself becoming an editor and a reviewer. So a lot of journals these days are using uh, automated systems to find reviewers and they'll look for other people who've published in this area and have a reasonable citation index. So they will find people who've been generating paper mill papers. So it's a bit scary. It's very much um, letting the, uh, you know, the, the, the evil people in. Uh, to, and once, of course, they're in, they're going to just multiply um, and the whole system is, is at risk of, of getting uh, infected with people who don't care about science at all and are just doing it to, to really make a profit. Um, public trust in science, of course, will also get uh, affected. And um, you also could argue it, it's not good for the journals and the publishers because their reputations are also affected. Although I have to say, you know, they don't, uh, they, they start to care about it if if you go on social media and mock them. Um, but there, there are some journalists and publishers that really seem very unwilling to respond when these problems are pointed out to them. And this is a common complaint of those who uncover some of these frauds, is that, you know, people are not doing much about it. The, the publishers are, are now involved in discussions at conferences about this and are claiming they are taking it seriously, they're appointing lots of people to try and clean it all up, um, but it isn't, certainly it isn't a very uh, effective or rapid process as, at the moment. Um, one other group I've put on this slide are those using paper mills, because you could argue that they are themselves victims, because they may think that, you know, they're doing a great thing getting a, a publication out, but if they are just consumers and not people who are really building a huge reputation, they are 
certainly anybody who uses and produces one of these crazy papers is at huge risk of reputational damage. And if somebody reads it and your name is affiliated with one of these crazy papers, you are, I would say, at risk of just sort of, you know, having your name trashed completely. So this is it's, it's, it's very parallel to sort of crime and fraud in, in other domains of life. You know, everybody basically uh, suffers and you need to really take it seriously and stamp it out. Um, but also, um, I mean, I used to think, you know, when I looked at some of the papers that were really crazy, uh, you know, they were in journals I wouldn't normally read and that didn't look very high ranking. And I thought, well, nobody's going to take any notice of them. And then I started to realise that there are instances of this beginning to also affect um, journals that we do take seriously. And that's even more serious in my mind, because then you've got the potential for the whole system being infiltrated. So, you know, surely these problems only affect low ranking journals. Well, um, actually, I think the answer is, I'll give you some examples where higher ranking journals are also affected. So this is Anna Avalkina, who is an expert on hijacked journals. That's another topic I won't talk about at length, but she's noted that extraordinary phenomenon where an entire journal can be sort of taken over by crooks um, and who, who just then start publishing rubbish in it. Um, and it, it's a remarkable phenomenon. And I recommend you read her work if you want to look at what happens with high, hijacked journals. Um, but I came across her in the context of that she'd uncovered a, a paper mill called the Tanu Pro paper mill originating in, uh, I think, Ukraine. Um, and the articles from this paper mill uh, were, uh, she, she found them because they were using fake email addresses for the authors. And we think for the peer reviewers too, but certainly for the authors. Um, and these articles might appear in special issues or in hijacked journals, but she uh, found six articles that were clearly psychology papers in a psychology journal. And as I'm a psychologist, I offered to look at them and they were all in the Journal of Community Psychology. Now, this is not a sort of, you know, weird little journal by a weird little publisher. It's, it's a reputable Wiley journal. It's got a long history. It was founded in 1973. Its editor, Michael B. Blank, is from the University of Pennsylvania. He's himself, if you look him up, he seems to have a reasonable publication track record and be a sort of a person you would expect to be an editor. Um, and so this is an influential professional journal. Um, and yet it seemed to have some paper mill papers in it. So this raises the question of how did that happen? So first of all, I looked at the papers and they were terrible. Um, so this is one, um, Journal of Community Psychology. I mean, it, it's, this abstract is a very typical paper mill product abstract. It's quite hard. It's all very vague. You're not at all clear what they did. Um, it's, it's got this sort of vague, uh, incoherence about it that you're, it takes you a while before you realise it's not you it's it that it really doesn't make sense but it's about extremism and preventing radicalism um, and uh, you know you, you can read that spread of radical intolerant leadership among young people and attempts to involve young people in extremely extremist activities are especially dangerous and then it says the novelty of the research is determined by the fact that the socio-psychological characteristics inherent in a young person, his superficial and uncritical perception of social life, determine his appeal to protest activist, protest activist methods of increasing his social status and role in public life, which are mostly spontaneous, spontaneous. Hmm, it's not clear to me what any of that actually means. And the key point is that the email address for this person who comes from Kazakhstan is this has got this uoel dot uk uh, pre suffix, which is not a real domain. It's made to look like a a, 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 a a university. It looks a bit like the domain for the University of East London, but it's not. Uh, and what is somebody from Kazakhstan doing, submitting a paper from a UK email address? Um, I did a detailed evaluation of all six papers, which you can find on PubPeer. Um, if you want to look at them, but they, they, they vary a bit. They're not all the same. Um, but I don't think these are written by machines. They could be. They look to me more like sort of the poor, um, you know, th bits of student dissertation or something by people who are not 
terribly good at writing dissertations. What about the peer review, though? Now, here we were really helped by the fact that peer review was open for this journal. It was optional, um, but it was uh, listed for this paper and for four of the six with named reviewers. And here immediately you see a problem. So the reviewer one is somebody who claims to be Georgina Smith from the University of Sunshine Coast, but has no presence online, as far as one can see. And the review is very unlike a real review because it just says, I rate this article quite positively and I think it's worthy for publication, but there are some inaccuracies. And then the vagueness of the suggestions is, is what's characteristic. The purpose and the objectives of the research are not stated in the introduction part. The large paragraph should be divided into smaller ones. Correct numerous inaccuracies in the typing. Literature should be refreshed since some of the citations are considered rather dating. And then by the time it came round for a second round of review, the paper was perfectly fine-tuned in accordance with all the comments that were indicated by the reviewers. I'm glad to recommend this manuscript for publication. Reviewer two, Eric Leitmeyer from the University of West Bohemia, again, somebody who it's very hard to find any evidence that they exist on Google. Um, and he is on the editorial board of a journal, but it's a very dodgy looking journal. <laughs> Otherwise, he's no, got no academic presence, no evidence of publication. And again, the review, first review in the paper, the authors used many figures and tables, which is certainly useful for readers. But some of the inscriptions on the figures are difficult to read. Please improve their quality. I can note that actually in the version that's online, uh, there are no figures. And then he says, it is necessary to revise the conclusion section, describe more clearly the obtained results. And then most of the references are too old. There is a need to refresh the literature. Interesting use of exactly the same phrase. And then by the time it comes back, I think this is a manuscript due to its factual nature, a rich methodological arsenal of research, a delicacy in the presentation of positions can be published in this journal. So you see why I think this is definitely not on. I mean, this is clearly absolutely fictitious. And, uh, you know, this is not like, it, you, you can look at other things in the same journal and you look at the peer reviews and they're like normal peer reviews. This is not like normal peer review. So how did it happen? I got very curious because this was not some sort of fly-by-night weird little journal. And I had two hypotheses. Either the editor uh, just doesn't read the papers, he accepts, he might be very busy, he might just sort of send things out to review and then if the reviewers agree it should be published, actually just publish them without even reading them. There are editors that do that, and I thought that was the most likely hypothesis. But the alternative is that he might be complicit. He might be getting a backhander for putting in these things. So I had the bright idea that we could actually test this by submitting a sting paper, which was not a... most sting papers are not real papers, but this would be a real paper that described the paper mill. Um, so we did that, and we could reject hypothesis A because the paper was rejected as being a superficial analysis of six papers. Um, so, of course, what we then did was to po post it open access as a preprint on SciArchive, and in fact we're now having it considered for publication in a journal, and we reported it to the integrity officer at Wiley on the 5th of September, uh, who ha did reply, uh, but so far no action seems to have been taken about the editor who is still in place, uh, which personally I think he should not be. Um, so anyway, this is a sort of long story, but th th this is something that's affecting the sort of journal that you would not expect to be affected by this sort of thing, and it does suggest that there can be problems with editors, and it's not the first time I've found problems with uh, editors of apparently reputable journals. Here's another example. Um, so the International Journal of Mental Health and Addiction. So this has been on my radar some while ago. I noticed, I can't remember how, but I noticed um, that I was looking at hyper-prolific authors, people who publish a huge amount. And Mark Griffiths from Nottingham Trent University does publish a huge amount, and he's very proud of it. And he, he's on Twitter all the time telling you how many papers he's published and how many citations he's got. But I noticed that in most of his publications are in two journals, and he's responsible for 12% of all publications in this particular journal, which I thought was a little bit worrying. 
Um, and I discussed it on my blog, and Griffiths, you know, defended himself and said, you know, this was a, if, if he was a workaholic who, who liked writing papers with international colleagues and, you know, didn't feel it was fair to sort of suggest there was anything wrong with doing this. Um, but then, a few days ago, a few weeks ago, this cropped up on an authorship for sale website. Um, and this is a paper co-authored by Griffiths with other people uh, that is published in the International Journal of Mental Health and Addiction, which appeared to have been offered for sale, for authorship for sale, um, prior, to the, prior to it appearing. For a, uh, You could become, there were three authorship positions available and you could pay $500 for one of these and it appeared with authorship affiliations two from Iran one from Indonesia one from Russia and Griffiths from the UK so um, this was posted on pub here I think it was Nick Wise yes who uh, drew attention to this and said you know what ho um, and Griffiths responded and basically said you know this is nothing to do with us we have no idea who posted that wasn't any of the co-authors. All of the authors made a genuine academic contribution and he listed them subsequently. None of them were paid. Um, the first author, a guy called Nab uh, Nabi N Nazawi or something, uh, Nazari, um, was the, who decided who should be an author and it was him who decided the order of the authors and the information in the screenshot is just untrue. Um, of course, what then happens is you start to think, well, let's look at Nabi Nazari. And you immediately find that he's had a prior retraction of a paper um, for reasons that seem to be to do with uh, both authorship and possibly accuracy of what's in the paper. He's very cross about it. He complains that this was unfairly treated. But he was also the co-author on another paper with a strange funding statement, which is this one, um, with a Chinese first author, and then Nabi Nazari, and then Mark Griffiths, again, fear and anxiety and COVID. Um, and somebody, not me, but somebody pointed out that the funding for this paper was rather strange, because it was uh, funding for a study on the value of perception and purchase behaviour of camellia oil in southeast Guizhou, based on consumer surveys. So they say, how did this come to be used to fund an online story about fear and anxiety and COVID in Iran? Um, and <laughs> Mark Griffiths at this point replies and says, it is confidential. Um, I then think, well, let's have a look at this. You, woo, you know, this is the trouble. You go down the rabbit hole and you start looking at different people. Um, and I found he had a very strange paper, also funded by the Camellia Oil um, people and with all sorts of inconsistencies between the text and the grass and so I put here this was a polite way of me saying you know this was this this paper by Chu Wu was a very clear paper mill product um, and uh, to which I get the response from Nazari not from Chu Wu himself but uh, say who gets very cross with me and says I shouldn't write about comments related to other articles in the special post of the article you want and you are not fair and moral I cannot help you also, this is not ethical and fair. I will not respond to your future comments. So, you know, this is a sort of fun one can have, I suppose, with this sort of thing. But, I mean, it's not fun, really, because it's really rather serious that we seem to have uncovered here something strange going on, and it's not clear who is responsible for the uh, authorship for sale thing, whether these authors are entirely innocent. But it does seem that if you start tracking down, starting with a paper like that, and you look at the other authors, that you start uncovering other irregularities. So what's to do? Um, I see I, I see the work, but easiest way of thinking about this is to think of paper mills as like a virus. Um, we were not aware of them, we ignored it, it's just like COVID for a while, we didn't know it was coming, and then it suddenly sort of took off like a rocket and it's rather overwhelmed people um, and we have to think about how to manage it and just as with a, a, a medical virus I think there are a number of things we can do which would include testing and tracing for it so documenting where is it occurring inoculating against it and quarantining those who are affected <laughs>
So uh, let me say how that works. Um, testing and tracing. So I think what the problem is, we're chasing, not just chasing a virus, but it's mutates because the people who run paper rules are very clever. They're making a huge amount of money out of this. So they are, uh, uh, have got a lot of vested interest and um, they are obviously able to employ people to do a lot of generation of fake stuff. Um, but some paper mill products are easy to spot just on cursory inspection. Others look more plausible. And I, my guess is we are probably missing a lot of fraudulent work. And this is what is quite frightening to think we're just picking up the, you know, the low hanging fruit. Uh, I mean, you know, if you go through the Journal of Environmental and Public Health, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. You know, you read the paper and, you know, like within three lines, there's something very crazy or a reference that doesn't belong. But I think that there are others that are much cleverer and there are some that I look at and I think, hmm, not sure. Um, but discovery of one paper mill article can lead to discovery of a network. But the work of tracing that is time consuming. I am now officially retired and I can put some time into this. But uh, you really need people focused on this much more forcefully given the scale of the problem. Because what you can start to do once you come across some of these cases is to look at other work by the same authors. You can look for other work with the same template structure. Uh, you can check to see whether figures uh, occur across articles. You can look for work from the same email address, uh, same citations being used, and there are some fascinating examples of repeated citations. Um, torture phrases have been very useful for turning up uh, fraudulent papers, plagiarised text, and indeed if you find an editor who's accepting this sort of stuff, you can start seeing what else have they accepted. Some of these tasks can be automated, and there's some very clever people uh, engaging in that sort of work. But as soon as you do automate it, it's likely that the paper mill owners will then change their strategy. Um, so open science can be really important, I think, in um, helping us get deal with this sort of problem. So this is why I'm linking this whole issue to this Open Science Week. Um, Jennifer Byrne has been very concerned about what can be done about the uh, paper mill products in her area, which, as we've seen, are really serious. I mean, this is cancer biology and we're being misled. Um, so she has recommended that studies in that field should be pre-registered, just as is the case with clinical trials now. Um, and indeed, some of us choose to pre-register work in other areas like psychology. Uh, but she suggests that if you had to pre-register your study, um, you would be able to tell not only had somebody done what they said they were going to do, but the time scale could be checked. Because what is happening is these papers are being uh, produced at a vast speed. To do one of those studies that uh, is referred to in the paper properly, she reckons, is you know work of months, if not years. Um, and so this would just stop them in their tracks if they had to demonstrate that they had pre-registered it. Um, and then you couldn't sort of start coming up with a publication a few weeks later. I think that's a great suggestion, but there's resistance in, in the community she works with. Open access is great. I find when I'm trying to explore one of these networks, there's nothing worse than suddenly coming up against a paper that you can't access because it's behind a paywall. And I'm at Oxford University, which has good access to many different uh, resources, but even so, I hit paywalls. And um, it is you know, just clear that if it makes the work of checking much easier if you can actually access the stuff. But particularly, it makes it easier if uh, there's open data and open code, but that is very rare. Uh, nearly all papers from paper mills tell you that they will provide their data on request, but very few of them, of course, would. I, it's almost not worth asking, because even when a paper is legitimate, people are reluctant to do that. So I think that that would be a game changer to have the open data and the open code. And then we come to open peer review, which of course was extremely useful in the case of the Journal of Community Psychology in, in revealing just how empty these uh, peer reviews were. And indeed they were similar across these different papers and they were turning up on the same date. You know, the whole thing was clearly uh, a fiction. But what I also want to have a shout out for is, is the open post-publication peer review that is po made possible with the PubPeer Online Journal Club. 
uh, and I showed you some examples of the sorts of things that can happen on Pub Pier, um, and it really is invaluable because it allows you to document cases of you know where you find issues but it also gives your authors an opportunity to respond and you can make a judgment yourself whether those responses seem adequate or not um, and so I think uh, pub peer is uh, you know an unsung hero in, in my mind the more I see of it the more I feel it's it's going to be a hugely useful weapon against fraud by allowing people to document when they come across it, and then you can then you can start to see patterns much more readily. Uh, you can see which journals reliably seem to have problematic articles. Unfortunately, though, none of this is adequately funded. A lot of it is done by people who are not uh, necessarily in secure academic positions, who do it um, as volunteers. Um, and who get little, precious little thanks for it. Uh, and indeed, if they write to publishers or journals uh, with concerns, often are just ignored or treated as if they're just terribly difficult people. Um, and this, I think, is quite shocking that we are not investing more effort into tackling this in this test and trace way, because if we don't do that, then um, we're going to end up with a much bigger problem. Um, of course, people always say, in addition, the incentive structure of academia is part of the problem. And if we could fix that, there would be no incentive. If you could make it so there was no incentive to have lots of highly cited papers, this whole uh, business model of paper mills would disappear. Um, but at the moment, hiring, firing, getting grants, all depends on publications and citations. Um, and there are ways to tackle that and... and, and get people less dependent on those proxy measures. But until they do, this is what's driving the problem. Um, you can game these, uh, these st statistics, as we've already seen from some of the examples. And this is a nice one um, that, again, Cyril Labbe uh, did. Um, he used SciGen to automatically generate 100 papers in computer science. And the first paper cites real literature, and then the subsequent papers all cite each other. And within a year, he had an H index of 92 on Google Scholar. Not him, but this fake person, Aiki Antkare. So, you know, this is, this is a real problem if you're going to rely on the H index and people can then sort of just fake it in this way. And this is the sort of thing that paper mills are doing. Um, there's also national variations on this. So um, in some countries, there's expectations that even applicants to graduate school should already have publications. And in some countries, there's a requirement for publications in order for the candidate to graduate with a doctorate or to practice as a doctor. And these may be people who have no talent for research and no interest in research, but it would be very good doing other things. I was a bit shocked because I had heard that this was the case in China. And then I was talking to somebody whose husband was, uh, um, I think, South African and wanted to practice medicine in the UK. And apparently you have to sort of get a certain number of points to qualify uh, to be recognised as, as, as being able to work in the National Health Service and some of those points you could get from having a first author publication. So it's not just China where this is happening. It does seem that these criteria are affecting uh, the UK and I'm sure many other countries. What about inoculation? So for me, inoculation is you get rid of the incentives and then your population is uh, protected against the whole thing. So the inoculation would include not using proxy publication metrics to evaluate one another, actually read the papers, or ask the way to really get at what's going on is to ask people for their so many best publications. So maybe your four best papers. What are your four best papers? Uh, will completely wipe out somebody who spent all their time publishing tons and tons of very trivial stuff or indeed fictitious stuff. Um, so I think that rule, which is already adopted by Wellcome Trust and some other funders, um, is much more sensible than just being impressed by quantity. Uh, you could also just say we should be giving up publishing in for profit journals altogether uh, because they are a big part of the problem. But of course, that's not going to happen anytime soon. I think we can push for it. Um, and the more people that do put their outputs in, for example, um, 
archives and uh, bioarchive or sci archive um, will the more perhaps the uh, traditional publishing model with for profit publishers might break down but it seems that they have a stranglehold and a very uh, much still uh, given too much kudos to my mind so institutions like Maynooth and other places if you're having an open access, open science sort of policy it's very important to align your incentives with that so that the incentive structure is such that when somebody is applying for promotion um, that, or for a post that they are set up to reward integrity rather than number of publications and using things like you know what are your best publications but also do you adopt open science practices that should be a bonus uh, do you promote open science that should be a bonus and if you're one of those researchers who actually works to expose research fraud that should be very positive uh, and unfortunately at the moment that's often not the case if we can make publishers change their ways um, then it would be good if they could stop this explosion in new journals and special issues. It's been incredible. There's been, it's been absolutely amazing growth of a kind that is really indicating that you know they just see this as the golden goose that will lay lots of eggs and bring in lots of income without much thought as to how to control quality. Um, they should be promoting open science, including pre-registration uh, for quality control, and I think they should actually, the I, I, more I look at editors and the role of editor, um, I think it's a difficult role, it takes a lot of time, and that it would be worth paying good editors so they have time to do a proper job. But it's the selection of editors that's a real problem, that people are getting into editorial positions, which once in, they can then use for their own advantage. Now, what about the equivalent of intervention? Uh, and I've suggested quarantine, but it, I mean, quarantine is usually... A temporary period. I, I think I'm feeling we should just cut out those people who are uh, engaging in paper mill and other fraudulent behaviour permanently. They have no place in science. They don't understand what science is all about. <clears throat> and the problem is that uh, if you report such people to institutions, you will typically find that there may be a response, there may not be a response. If there is a response, it is typically very, very slow. Um, now, institutions have to go through due process and a proper procedure if they're going to investigate um, some sort of malpractice. Um, and they're often not geared up to do it. They often have, I spoke recently with um, Vice Chancellor or Pro Vice Chancellor at an institution who said, We'd never come across a case like this before after they had been confronted with somebody who was clearly uh, part of a paper mill. Um, but the tendency is to brush problems under the carpet and hope that they will just go away. Typically they won't. I mean, this used to be how sexual abuse uh, charges were regarded. And these days, uh, I think that's getting harder and your, your reputation can be damaged if you don't deal with it. But there is this reluctance to deal adequately, um, particularly if it involves an academic who brings in grants. And there are genuine worries about reputational costs and legal challenges. Personally, I think your reputation is enhanced if you're seen to be dealing with this, but legal challenges can be uh, such that people feel it would cost more than it's worth, even if they know they're right, uh, to start doing something like firing somebody. Personally, I think we need a national centralised body to investigate allegations of paper mill involvement and other scientific fraud and to recommend consequences for this. But the job of such an organisation would be 100 times easier if everyone adopted open science practices. So, um, publishers, finally, um, they typically talk about you know, needing to educate their editors to recognise paper mills without realising that a lot of the time the editor is the problem. So uh, I think there really needs to be more scrutiny of who gets to be an editor and rapid eviction of editors who are using journals for self-promotion or who take bribes. Just shouldn't be allowed. Um, they need to develop criteria for papers that are erroneous and they need to employ experts to do this. They claim that they're starting to do that. It goes very slowly. And it's, it's, I think it is difficult because I think if you're an experienced uh, researcher who's published a lot, you can look at a paper very rapidly and pick out problems, whereas if you're not in the field and you, you haven't done a lot of publishing, it may be harder to distinguish what is sensible and what is not. <clears throat> 
But unambiguous cases like some of these crazy papers that make no sense, I think should be promptly retracted, whereas at the moment, again, there seems to be a very slow system that starts contacting the authors for an explanation of why this is... The, you know, which really... Um, there will be cases which are ambiguous where you need to do that, but there's such a lot of work that's clearly crazy that should just not be allowed. Uh, but you're, well, otherwise, you're leaving this virus sink to fester. All of these papers will have these fake... Um, or many of them will have some sort of fake citations. Those citations will remain even if the paper is retracted. So you've you know, really got to try and prevent those papers getting out there in the first place. Um, it's really problematic. But adopt open peer review and work with PubPeer to identify the problems early. PubPeer does offer uh, publishers, I believe, some sort of uh, route into, so that they can easily check out on particular journals. Um, but uh, I don't know how many of them are actually doing that. So uh, that is all I have to say on this topic. Um, I wanted to leave time for questions. Uh, it's a fast-moving area. It's, it's quite remarkable how rapidly uh, this sort of new pandemic has taken hold of science. Um, I hope it doesn't dismay you too much. I think we need to know about it in order to tackle it. But I think that um, at the moment we are sort of coasting along uh, and we are at high risk of having science um, really uh, infested with the, the, this fraudulent work and it will make it difficult to distinguish the good from the bad. So that's the end of the talk.